Every now and then I go to my uh, optometrist to get my eyes checked out. Uh, I sit on the chair, uh, squinting, trying to read all those small letters that are coming up in front of me. I sit in front of that awful machine that, that blows wind in your, in your eyeball uh, to test the pressure. And uh, every time I go to my optometrist, uh, he says that my eyes are getting worse and worse. Uh, in fact, sometimes as I sit there with my optometrist, I wonder what it would be like to be blind. Uh, I mean, imagine not being able to move about freely because you can't actually see what is in front of you. Imagine not being able to see colour and light uh, or the people that you love because your whole world is plunged into darkness. Uh, Thankfully, I I can still see reasonably well uh, with glasses, but I can't imagine too many worse things than to be blind. Uh, Now, friends, I want you to imagine another situation. Uh, This time, imagine you're in a dungeon. Uh, You've been locked up in a dark prison. Uh, You have no matches. You have no light. You have no keys. Uh, You are stuck in this dungeon, and there is absolutely no way out. Uh, From time to time, we hear horrible stories, don't we, of people who uh, have been locked up in this way for many years before they are freed. And again, I can't think of a more awful situation than to be locked up like this. Uh, It's a pretty depressing way to begin this morning, I think, Um, but I want you to see that this is the way that the Bible describes the plight of people in this world. The nations... Are blind, says God. The nations are imprisoned in a dark dungeon. Uh, you see this all the way through the scriptures, but in particular, if you have your, uh, the passage out in front of you from Isaiah 42, uh, you see it in verses 6 to 7. Uh, the nations are blind uh, and need their eyes to be opened. The nations are imprisoned and they need to be set free. But, uh, friends, what does it mean to be blind and imprisoned like this? What is Isaiah talking about here? Uh, Well, in order to understand chapter 42 of Isaiah, uh, we need to first understand the background uh, in Isaiah 41. And uh, we won't have uh, much time to look at all of chapter 41 this morning. But uh, uh, the thing that you need to know is that Isaiah 41 Uh, really has to do with the nations. Uh, In Isaiah 41, it is the nations that are called to account. They are dragged before uh, God's courtroom where they are put on trial. And uh, what is it that characterizes these nations? Well, uh, you can see there that the thing that marks out the nations is their idolatry. It is the worship of false gods. Uh, You can see there, for example, uh, if you have a look at chapter 41, verse 7. Uh, Turn with me to chapter 41, verse 7, and uh, look at what it says. Chapter uh, chapter 41, verse 7. The craftsman strengthens the goldsmith, and he who smooths with the hammer, him who strikes the anvil, saying of the soldering, it is good, and they strengthen it with nails so that it cannot be moved. Uh, What you see here, friends, is the pitiful image of people turning to their idols in the face of God's coming judgment. They can see there that uh, what they do is they nail their statues and their idols down so that their idols won't topple over in the futile hope that these idols and statues will be able to provide some security and safety when God's judgment comes. Uh, Or, uh, have a look with me further down at verse 21. Uh, Verse 21 of chapter 41. Uh, Set forth your case, says the Lord. Bring your proofs, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring them and tell us what is to happen. Tell us the former things, what they are, that we may consider them, that we may know their outcome. 
or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what is to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Do good or do harm, that we may be dismayed and terrified. Behold, you are nothing, and your work is less than nothing. An abomination is he who chooses you. You see, uh, here it is the idols themselves that are put on trial by God. And God says that they are nothing because these idols cannot tell you what has come in the past and they cannot tell you what is to come in the future. They just sit there. However, God, on the other hand, is the one who knows the past as well as the future. Now, that's why uh, in verse 25 of chapter 41, he can tell his people about the one who is uh, stirring up from the north. Uh, he's predicting here that Cyrus, the king of Persia, will and set the people of Israel free from their exile in Babylon. You see, God can predict the future. He says this will happen, and it does happen in 530 8 BC, as Cyrus sweeps down from the north and sets Israel free from cap- captivity. You see, God is the Lord of history, unlike the eyes. Uh, friends, knowing the past is so important, isn't it? Because if you know your past, you know where you come from, and you know who you are. And knowing the future is important, because if you know the future, you know the things that you are to live for. You see, God has created us in such a way that we often ask ourselves questions, don't we? Like, who am I? And what am I here on this earth to do? What am I here for? Uh, No other creature does this, by the way. Uh, As far as I can tell, uh, my pet dog, Shadow, uh, doesn't lie awake at night wondering, who am I? Uh, What am I doing here? But we human beings are different. We wonder, who are we? What are we doing here? What is the meaning of life? In fact, we yearn for answers to these kind of questions, and they are questions that only God can answer. But how does idolatry make us blind and imprisoned. How does idolatry make us blind and imprisoned? Uh, Well, I think it's because we become like the thing that we worship. Uh, You see, in the Bible, there is a strand of teaching that tells us that we actually become like the things that we love in our lives. Uh, a few weeks ago, I took my son Levi uh, to a soccer match uh, at ANZ Stadium. Uh, it was a, it, between a team from Sydney uh, and a well-known uh, uh, team from London. Uh, it's it, an English team that my son and I support. Uh, the team colour is red. And so uh, my son and I put on uh, the, the team colours. We put on a red T-shirt and uh, tried to find everything red that we could wear. And uh, when we got to the stadium, uh, we saw that everyone was dressed in red. Thousands of people wanting to be like the stars on the pitch. You see, we want to become like the thing we love. We want to become like our idols. Similarly, God says that we become like the idols that we worship. Uh, I don't know whether you noticed, uh, but in our psalm reading this morning, uh, the psalmist makes exactly this point. Uh, if you have your Bibles there, turn with me back to Psalm 135. Uh, psalm 135. And uh, look what it says at verse 15. Psalm 135, uh, verse 15. Uh, if somebody has a pew Bible, can you call out uh, the the page number that it's on? 520. Thank you, Elsie. 520. Psalm 135, verse 15. It says, The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak. 
that have eyes but do not see, that have ears but do not hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths. And listen to this. It says, those who make them become like them, and so do all who trust in them. Those who make them become like them, and so do all who trust in them. You see, those who trust in idols become just like their idols. Uh, If it's money we trust, then we'll become just as cold and lifeless as the money that we worship. It's interesting, isn't it, uh, that uh, in chapter 41, the idols are those who cannot tell the past, tell you the past, nor tell you the future. They just sit there in the present with nothing much to offer. Uh, And I wonder whether as our society moves further and further away from the God who has created us, well, we will see more and more people who live just for the present, who cannot know the bigger things in life. But the point here is that just like the idols who cannot see, those who trust in them will become blind just like their idols. Uh, Now, this isn't talking, of course, about physical blindness. Uh, It's talking about uh, a spiritual blindness, an inability to see the truth about who God is and his rightful rule over our lives. They will become only slaves to the idols that they serve. Uh, Further, notice that this spiritual blindness is not something that is just an innocent mistake. Rather, in choosing to worship idols, we willfully reject the God who has created us and we personally offend him. Uh, If you flip back with me to Isaiah 41, uh, listen to what Isaiah says in uh, verse 24. Uh, In verse 24 of Isaiah 41, Behold, you idols are nothing, and your work is less than nothing. An abomination is he who chooses you. Uh, It's very strong language, isn't it? That those who choose idols are an abomination to God. Uh, Friends, uh, what are the idols that you and I worship in our lives? Uh, It was uh, the famous reformer John Calvin who famously said that the human heart is an idol factory. We're very good at churning out uh, idols in our hearts to worship. What are those things that we would rather worship than God? What are the things that take your attention and my attention away from the God that we are to worship? Well, uh, what then is the answer to the plight of the nations? What then is the answer to the plight of the nations? Uh, Isaiah answers by introducing us to a mysterious figure called the servant. Uh, You can see that uh, chapter 42 begins with the word, Behold. It's a word that means, look. In the previous chapter, God uses the word to invite us to look at how futile the idols are. Chapter 41, verse 24, Behold, you are nothing. Chapter 41, verse 29, Behold, they are all a delusion. But here, God invites us to behold and to look at the servant. Now, there are three things I want you to notice about this servant. Uh, Firstly, notice that he is God's servant. Uh, In chapter 42, verse 1, God says that he is my servant and my chosen and my soul's delight and my spirit will be upon him. You see, unlike the nations who have willfully and foolishly walked away from God, this servant will be one who enjoys an intimate relationship with God himself. Secondly, Notice the mission of this servant. The mission of this servant is to bring justice to the nations. 
Uh, you can see it there at the end of verse 1, can't you? He will bring forth justice to the nations. Or in verse 3, he will faithfully bring forth justice. Or again in verse 4, he will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice on the earth. Uh, the word justice there uh, has a bit of a ring of punishment to it, doesn't it? Uh, one day God will punish wrongdoing and punish those who have rejected him in favour of idols. Now, uh, we like this idea of justice. In fact, it's hard to live in this world and think about all the evil in this world and not long for justice, not long for uh, the wrongdoing to be punished. But friends, you've got to be careful what you ask for because justice is only good news if you and I are not the wrongdoer. It is only good news if you and I are on the right side of the God who will one day bring his justice into the world. However, the idea of justice in Isaiah is actually a much bigger idea than just that of punishment. Uh, It's also the idea of the whole world being reordered rightly under God. Uh, It's talking about putting this upside-down world uh, back the right way around again. Uh, I don't know whether you're old enough to remember Mr. Squiggle. Uh, Does anyone remember Mr. Squiggle? Um, (laughs) uh, People over the age of um, 30-something... Um, uh, If you're not aware of who Mr. Squiggle uh, is or was, uh, Mr. Squiggle was a man from the moon, and uh, he had a pencil for a nose. Uh, It was a children's program. And uh, if you remember, he drew pictures upside down, so that when you're actually looking at him drawing, you have no idea uh, what he's doing. Uh, Until they put the drawing the right way around again, and suddenly uh, it all makes sense what he, w- he was doing. Uh, that's the kind of thing that Isaiah is talking about here, except on a world scale. You see, through idolatry, the nations have turned the world upside down. Rather than having God at the top as king and submitting to his rule, so that we can rule the creation in the way that God had desired, well, we live in a world that is completely the opposite, isn't it? We live in a world where people worship created things and then we put ourselves on top of God thinking that we are better than God and know better than God about how to live our lives. But what happens when everyone in this world thinks that they are the king and that they know better than God? Well, you have war, don't you? You have war, not only on an international level, as nations think they know better than other nations, but you have war in society and in our marriages and in our relationships as we selfishly wrong one another and exploit one another and hurt one another in defiance of God. In fact, we are so accustomed to doing wrong that it's impossible sometimes to untangle all the wrongdoing that we've done and the lies and deception in our lives so that we can make it right again. Often we cry out for things to be made right in this world, but we can't even seem to do it in our own lives. But here God says that his servant will be the one who brings justice to this world. He will be the one who reorders this world under God. And how will the servant do this? Well, thirdly, you'll notice that he will do it in a very strange way. He will powerfully bring justice into the world, but he will do it with gentleness. He won't do it by shouting others down or by self-promotion, which is the way most people want to have their voices heard these days. 
In verse 2 it says, He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. Neither will he do it by crushing others and trampling on others, which is what the powerful usually do in this world. In verse 3 it says that a breed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. Imagine a, a thin reed by the side of a lake that's been damaged and bent. This servant is so gentle that he won't even break it. Or imagine a candle that's just about burned out. This servant is so gentle that he won't even snuff it out. However, even though he is gentle, he has great strength. In verse 4, he says that he will not grow faint or be discouraged. Literally, he won't be bruised until he has accomplished his mission. But friends, uh, the million-dollar question is, who is this servant? Uh, Well, the kids' talk kind of gave it away. But uh, if you've been a careful reader of Isaiah, you might have noticed that actually there are a number of possibilities uh, in the book of Isaiah. Firstly, it could be Cyrus, the king of Persia, Uh, He certainly was somebody who was chosen by God, wasn't he? He certainly was somebody who served God's purposes. But can you think about why this can't be talking about Cyrus? I wonder whether you can just uh, chat to the person sitting next to you and uh, think about why this can't be talking about Cyrus. I'll give you a a moment to, to think about it. Uh, All right, somebody tell me why this can't be Cyrus. Uh, Yes, yep, yep. Um, Do we have uh, an indication that he has to be an Israelite here in the passage? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So he's, uh, he's not an Israelite. Yep, die. He is talking about the future. Yeah. No, Cyrus is in the future. Yeah. Um, the, the latter part of Isaiah um, is set sort of in the exile period um, when uh, Israel were taken captive to Babylon, um, but Cyrus um, is another 150 years down, down the track. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's getting closer. So... Uh, If you have a look at chapter 41, verse 25, uh, you'll notice that Cyrus is described there as the one who will trample on rulers. Uh, You know, my my kids go outside to the front yard and and stomp on, you know, those crunchy autumn leaves. Um, That's what Cyrus will do to the nations uh, when he comes to liberate uh, Israel. He's, he's um, He's a powerful military ruler. And yet we've seen that uh, the servant uh, will be gentle. He won't cry aloud. Uh, he won't you know, break a, 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 a bruised reed nor snuff out a burning wick. So I don't think he can be Cyrus. But secondly, uh, could this servant be describing the whole nation of Israel? And I think that's getting close to what what Piri was mentioning. Uh, Because if you just turn back to chapter 41, verse 8, uh, chapter 41, verse 8, you can see there that it is the nation of Israel who is described as God's servant. It is Israel who is the one he has chosen. It is Israel who is the apple of his eye. However, again, if you kind of trace through what happens with the nation of Israel, uh, Israel doesn't seem to be the perfect fit either. For even after they were freed by Cyrus from captivity in Babylon to return to Jerusalem, the people of Israel never really rose to the same heights as it did before. It would be a stretch to say that they were the nation who brought justice 
to the nations around them. However, fast forward several hundred years, and there was one Israelite who starts to look like the real deal. Uh, when Jesus is baptised by John the Baptist in the, in the Jordan River, uh, which we read in, in Matthew's Gospel this morning, well, Matthew tells us that the Spirit descended upon him, and with great delight, God declares, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Now, that might be a bit of a fluke. But turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. Have a look at Matthew chapter 12. Um, If you come to Matthew chapter 12, you'll notice there uh, in verse 18 that Matthew quotes from Isaiah 42. Uh, Verse 18, Matthew quotes from Isaiah uh, 42. Uh, He obviously thinks that uh, Jesus is the servant. But what is it about Jesus that makes him think that he is the servant? Well, if you have a look at verse 15, it is because Jesus heals the sick and then curiously orders people not to make him known. You see... Jesus is the one who has tremendous power to heal. But he will not cry aloud or promote himself just like the servant of Isaiah. Later on, we read as Jesus is betrayed by his friend Judas with a kiss and set upon by armies. Well, he could have called upon a legion of angels to trample on those who would arrest him. And yet, he does not cry out aloud or complain. He does not simply break those who try to break him. But he willingly does his father's will by going to the cross. Now, we've already seen that the servant's mission is to bring justice to the nations. Uh, But if you turn back with me to uh, Isaiah chapter 42, uh, you'll notice there that God speaks to the servant and tells him how this will happen. Uh, In chapter 42, verse 6, uh, listen to what God says to the servant. He says, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. You see, Jesus comes as a covenant and as a light. Uh, A covenant is a a contract between two parties, isn't it? Um, A contract where two parties make certain promises to one another. Uh, A marriage is a covenant in that sense as two people come together promising to be committed to one another. Uh, What God is saying here is that Jesus is the one who will bring the nations and God together under a new contract, under a new deal, where God promises the forgiveness of sins through the blood of Jesus. And further, Jesus comes as the light revealing the truth about who God is so that those who were spiritually blind can now see God and be freed from their idolatry to serve the true and living God in their lives. Now, friends, do you know this Jesus? Do you know this Jesus who can bring you to God with the covenant promise to forgive your sins and my sins? Do you know this Jesus who can open your eyes so that you see the truth of who God is and so that you can be freed from slavery to sin and idols that promise so much and yet deliver so little? Uh, If you don't know this Jesus this morning, then will you turn to him today? Uh, Will you turn away from serving the idols in your life, whatever they might be, things that replace God in your life, 
and turn to him instead and accept his offer of forgiveness so that you can be free to worship the true and living God. But friends, uh, some of you might be thinking to yourself this morning, well, of course it's Jesus. Uh, it's so obvious. Uh, it's always about Jesus. But before I finish, I just want to show you that it's not as simple as that. For if you turn with me to Acts 26, I want you to uh, see uh, what the Apostle Paul says. Uh, Acts 26. Uh, Here the Apostle Paul is in custody for proclaiming the name of Jesus during his final missionary journey. And uh, he's brought before the Jewish king Agrippa to make a defense. Uh, But listen to what he says to the Jewish king about his conversion when he met Jesus Christ for the first time. It's there in verse 16. Uh, Acts 26, verse 16. Uh, uh, Paul says that Jesus said to him these words, But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things you have seen me, uh, seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you, uh, you from your people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by me. Uh, who is the servant in this passage? Well, here it is Paul, isn't it? who is commissioned by Jesus to be his servant to take the news about Jesus to the nations so that blind eyes might be opened and prisoners set free as they experience the forgiveness of sins that comes only in Jesus' name. You see, it is Paul and it is Christian people who come after Paul Uh, People like you and me, who are to be servants, proclaiming the wonderful news about Jesus to those around us. And so, uh, tomorrow, as you go to uh, your workplaces, or your places of study, or your your network of friends, uh, God asks, will you serve me in this way? What a wonderful message we have to proclaim that through this good news, blind eyes can be opened and prisoners set free from their bondage. And what a wonderful God who gives us the privilege of playing a part in his mission to give sight to the spiritually blind and freedom to those who are captive to sin and idolatry in this world. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, so much for your word to us this morning. Uh, We thank you, Father, for Jesus. Uh, We thank you, Father, that he is the servant that Isaiah speaks of. And thank you, Father, that uh, he came into this world not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And we thank you, Father, that Uh, Through him, uh, you have opened our blind eyes. Uh, Thank you that for many of us here, uh, you have set us free from the guilt of sin and idolatry in our lives. But we pray, Father, that if there are any here who do not know Jesus uh, in this way, uh, that you would please draw them to yourself and help them to turn to you for forgiveness um, and for sight and to be freed from the bondage of sin and idolatry. And Father, we thank you that uh, in your kindness, uh, you call us to be uh, your servants as well. Uh, We thank you that you are at work in this world, uh, reordering this world as the gospel of the Lord Jesus is proclaimed and as 
the lives of people are turned the right way up as they come to see the truth of Jesus and as they submit to his rightful rule over them. And so we pray that we might be these people and we pray that you would help us to proclaim uh, this great news to those around us who live in darkness. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.